Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is the second version of, or second edition of my uh, video blogging, which is weekly. Or at least I'm hoping I'll keep up the energy and keep it weekly. So this last week, it's been uh, interesting. I've been getting used to uh, to not having a job and working on my own projects and having more time to walk in the park, to run. I mean, the weather has helped a little bit with that too. Uh, and just basically to de-stress after uh, that last job, which at times was pretty rough. Um, so last Sunday, I went to a gathering, uh, a, a current events gathering called uh, um, uh, Three Topics Over Dinner. Uh, it's run by someone I know named uh, named Bill, and uh, it it covers controversial uh, current events uh, topics, things going on in society. From well, he's a kind of, I would probably describe him as being a right-leaning libertarian. Not very far right-leaning, uh, politically necessarily, but culturally uh, right-leaning. Um, and uh, the topic this week was gender differences. So we read the uh, Larry Summers. Um, uh, he was the, the president of Harvard, and he uh, was kind of shooed out of his job after making a speech on differences that he saw between uh, between men and women in the sciences and more broadly, uh, more broadly in society. And Summers hypothesized that um, that because of genetics, uh, and he he, pro he does provide a particular mechanism for this, which I'll, I'll get in, uh, into in a moment. Um, I should say it up front that I don't agree with Summers, um, but he uh, he hypothesized that women. Uh, are much closer to the mean in terms of ability, dedication, uh, dedication to work, things like that. Uh, whereas men tend to have much greater standard deviation, so you end up with having uh, a more even spread between uh, high capability and low capability, um, and it's a relatively flat curve. Uh, a flat curve, whereas for women, Summers described more of a uh, more of a strong peak uh, in when it uh, in terms of how many people have average ability. I mean, strong uh, peak in in term, uh, in around average when it comes to ability, a small standard deviation. And the mechanism that Summers proposed for this is that um, he noted that most men uh, in our in our species. Uh, historically speaking, didn't have children. Uh, that is, for most men, they're an evolutionary dead end, or at least they were. They never found a significant other, never mated. And by contrast, uh, most women did uh, did mate, and they mated uh, more, and and have more children than men. And he suggests that this. A long-lasting effect created, uh, it, or rather, it allowed for more uh, genetic diversity in terms of the Y chromosome, uh, and that uh, that the, and presumably that the performance differences that he talked about are linked, are Y chromosome linked, um, which I think might make some sense if you know a little bit about genetics, but don't necessarily know a lot about genetics and aren't going to go digging around to see how plausible this is. Um, as far as I understand, and I'm not a genetics expert, I try to keep current on the sciences as best I can. I consider myself an academe. I attend endless lectures on uh, basically any academic topic that I can, but I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, if you find studies that show I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. Or at least I'm probably wrong if they're mainstream accepted studies. Um, but there's not that much that's Y chromosome link that uh, links, as far as I know, uh, in in those areas. The brain is not that strongly uh, different between men and women, and I I'm unaware of any studies that that show. That, that actually show significant thinking differences in terms of uh, brain layout between men and women. So what Summers actually dismissed in, uh, 
in his uh, in his talk, which I actually find to be the most plausible mechanism, is that most of the differences between the genders come down to us socializing men and women women differently, and to a, a lesser extent, uh, there are differences in terms of biology, uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, men on average weigh, I think, somewhere around 170% uh, as much as women do. Uh, there are consequences of sex that are different than men and women due to the different biologies. Um, if, uh, particularly in, in like evolutionary times, if a man got someone uh, pregnant, well, he could still skip off and the preg pregnancy would still happen. He'd still be a father, whereas the mother uh, or at least the, the would-be mother has a long gestation period uh, to uh, to deal with, which would create a certain amount of risk aversion and sexual behavior, things like that. And it, it seems plausible to me that maybe that got worked into into our genetics, um, maybe into our epigenetics in, in some sense, or I mean to some degree. But the broad differences that Summer describes don't seem plausible to me, or at least they don't seem likely to me. They're plausible. I don't think they're likely, and I don't think people should listen to Summers unless he can actually back up his claims with some studies. It's just wild speculation from somebody talking outside his field who doesn't have even some amount of particular plausibility in his field. Um, but we went over that. Uh, I the, con the discussion wasn't all that great because uh, I guess I have fairly different standards from what the ho uh, from what uh, the host and some of the other people there find um, uh, for what we should find convincing. And I think there was a little bit of mutual disappointment that the discussion wasn't better. We ended up me uh, meandering off to other topics. Um, but just to me, it, it was a pretty easy paper to back down as saying this even if this, even if this is right, it's not making the argument that it needs to be convincing. And so, if it's right, it's largely right by coincidence or by things that the author notes that he's not sharing with us, or, or something like uh, something like that. I, I just didn't find it to be worthy of a deep discussion, and it wasn't a good seed for a discussion. Um, I mean, uh, part of it is this, this is a flat-out empirical question. And you're not really going to have a lot of philosophy on uh, on a topic that should just be settled by science. Now, there are interesting additional uh, additional questions that we might ask that are philosophical in nature. In that, if this is true, how should it change our policies? How should it change our activism? If this is false, how should it change our policies and our activism? And for me, the answer there is that it probably shouldn't change our policies a lot, because even if there are differences between uh, men and women that have uh, some statistical significance, the, the issue is that that's statistics. And that means that uh, you're going to have this bell curve. Uh, and if it's differently shaped for men and women, you're still going to have some people over here, I guess I should be over here because the image, the video, I think, is reversed. I think this is the right side. Maybe it's the left side. Uh, I should check this out. But you're going to have, for almost any profession you might name, both men and women who are capable of it, who are interested in it, who want to make it their life's passion, or who find it a good match for their career at this time. And I think we should want to leave those doors open for people. And we shouldn't be shoving people too much into certain topics because you're not going to serve well uh, people who aren't average. And I realize that society is not based around people who are sufficiently outside the norm. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be. It, it probably shouldn't be. But it leaves room for them. And I think if you are going to create these kinds of effects, you need to have a pretty good reason. And I don't really see a good reason here to... We shouldn't be steering women away from STEM topics. We shouldn't be steering men towards STEM topics. I think, generally, we shouldn't be telling men or women what types of careers that, uh, they should have different from each other any more than we should tell 
the different races to have different um, have different types of careers. Even if, and this is a big if, even if you could show differences in proficiency uh, uh, between the means of those populations, the the people outside the mean at the mean still are members of society, and you will always have some women who are better than some men uh, at, on STEM topics. And of course, I wouldn't discount the possibility of it. We might find that the opposite of what Summers expects to be true, once we correct for the, um, once we correct for the enculturation differences between men and women. We might actually find uh, women are better at STEM topics. We might find that we've really been giving up on so much genius. We might be giving up on more than the, the level of genius that we could have had uh, or, or that we would have, presuming that, the, that they're largely the same on these topics. We might be giving up on more than that. So, so that does touch on one of the differences that we might decide is relevant um, based on the actual differences, and that how much cultural steering are we going to do uh, and how will we know when activism is done um, on, on gender topics for, uh, for career outcomes um, if there are actually are differences in proficiency? Uh, let's say that group A uh, is actually 20% um, better at STEM topics than group B. And group A, because they find it less frustrating, they stick in STEM topics uh, longer uh, than, than group B. If, if we presume that, that A and B actually aren't different, we're going to want to keep on pushing activism until they're literally the same. If we figure out that they actually um, are different, then we might decide not to do so much activism um, when things begin to approach the, uh, uh, the differences in proficiency, if, if we could actually even quantify that. So I think that's fair. Uh, although we might decide to even keep doing that kind of activism uh, just to make sure that accidental sexism doesn't end up locking out some very suitable people from some jobs uh, or from some of these jobs. Uh, we might need to do that continually on some low level just to, to keep the percentages matching. Anyhow, it, um, it could have been an interesting discussion. I, I did some uh, some blogging on Google Plus on this uh, afterwards, which I think was probably a little bit more interesting. Um, on Monday, I meant to be doing a lot of work on some teaching computer science videos and to actually record a new version of uh, of my third video in my teaching uh, teaching programming with Perl and Python uh, class or a third uh, in my course, but I didn't quite, uh, didn't quite get there. I did some work on it. Um, I was actually kind of uh, thrown off by one of the irritants that I have with, um, with word processors. Right now I'm using Google Office just because I can uh, edit the videos from anywhere, uh, from my phone, from my tablet, from uh, my Chromebook, from uh, one of my desktops. And um, <coughs> and I don't need to uh, to sync up uh, between there, but the problem that I, I have there is that there's no regular expression support, and there's a lot of reformatting to do as I try and edit this thing into shape, add details, cut and paste some uh, code samples in from my already existing examples that I used to teach in person classes, uh, stuff like that. No regex support in a text editor is. Or, or, well, in a word processor, anything that edit, edits text, it's very frustrating not having that. Um, so in case you don't know what a regular expression is, it's a mini programming language that manipulates text. Like you could find all, uh, all instances of the letter A that are preceded by uh, B and uh, F in the same word. Uh, and maybe you could replace them with some other string of characters. Uh, you can actually build very complicated things in regular expressions. They're wonderful. I spent the time to learn them because uh, my preferred programming language, uh, Perl, it, it makes it very uh, natural to use them. Um, but it just makes it all the more frustrating when I'm dealing without them. 
in bodies of text. Even for something like get rid of all of the tabs for lines that look like, uh, or at the start of lines that look like this, you can easily do that with a regular expression. You're, if you're trying to do that uh, outside of a regular expression, then you usually have a lot more complications to do. Or, I mean, a lot more complicated figuring to do. Anyhow, that was Monday. On Tuesday, I went. Uh, I had a mild migraine for most of the day, but it got better enough that near the end of it, I went to an event called the American Museum of Natural History Field Trip to the Moon, which was pretty neat. It, it was only the visualization that, uh, well, no, it wasn't quite, that's not quite true. It was mainly the visualization that made it cool. It was held in the, um, in the dome, and the astronomy dome. The Astronomy Dome at AMNH has two modes. They have, um, they can just project stuff onto the curved ceiling, which is really cool. It's kind of like uh, an Omnimax. Or they have something called, I think, a, a, a Zeiss projector, or Zeiss projector, which, um, which rises out of the floor when, it, when it's needed. Uh, it's a very expensive piece of equipment, and it projects stars very accurately into the right, uh, into appropriate places on the ceiling. Very cool. Uh, this was just done with the normal projectors. Um, and so they gave you kind of a wraparound experience of walking through, uh, uh, of walking through the approach to a space shuttle. You, and you have uh, th this, these construction labs all around you. Or, I mean, construction, this construction area all around you, where they actually build the, uh, the shuttles. So you're walking through that, you walk up to the shuttle, and you, uh, and you basically pop inside, and it shows you what it, uh, what it would look like to actually be lifted off, uh, off of our planet, up into space, you rotate around the Earth once, and then more rockets fire, and, and you go and you land on the moon, and you, and you see uh, the moon in a nice 3D perspective. It's it's really immersive, which is what made that, most of what made it cool. It wasn't super informative, although I didn't know that space shuttles normally rotated around the Earth once, or at least they sometimes do. I don't know how often they do before they head to the moon. But, yeah, very cool. Um, it might not quite have been as neat as I thought. I normally AM and H has uh, question and answer sessions after their presentations, but they didn't have one this time, which is okay. It just it would have been neat to have uh, been able to have asked uh, questions. I uh, I'm, I probably would have asked about that uh, rotation around the or, or the looping around the Earth before heading to the Moon. I am curious about that, and I I do. You, probably about half the time try to, to ask a question at most uh, most of the scientific events that I go to in New York City, but, oh well. Um, so on Wednesday, I went to two presentations. One was held by the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, it's called Making the Web Work for Science, and it was about open science initiatives. Um, <clears throat> Pretty neat. I wrote, I wrote about it on Google Plus. Um, I actually wasn't aware that that Mozilla was involved in that kind of thing. I'm still kind of puzzled at, at how the Mozilla Foundation makes its money. Uh, is it donations? Does it actually have a revenue stream? Um, but it's neat that they're doing this kind of thing. Um, a few years back, I uh, applied for work uh, um, there, but. I think my unwillingness to move to California, I'm not a big fan of California, um, uh, it's, it probably sunk me, which was unfortunate, but I guess I, I understand it, and I do prefer being in a workplace where I actually can go in, have my own space, uh, chat with, with nice academic coworkers, uh, shoot the breeze, just see other people. Uh, working from home, <clears throat> I think it's kind of wearing. Uh, later that evening, I went to uh, another. Uh, went to an event at the American Museum of Natural History. Oh yeah, the, the making the uh, web work for science that was at Rockefeller University. Um, 
but the AM and H event I went to later that night was the Isaac Asimov Memorial Debate. And it was about, uh, it was titled Selling Space, which um, it's actually something which I'm more or less opposed to. I, I don't like the idea of commercializing space. I don't think it's likely to produce big benefits for people. I think uh, we have most of the resources we need. The cost of getting additional resources from space is high. A lot of the time people talk about getting precious minerals, but we don't actually need that much in the way of precious minerals. It's not going to improve the quality of life for people all that much, as far as I know, and uh, particularly given the costs. And yeah, maybe we could get the costs down, but it's still always going to be pretty expensive getting uh, human beings into space. You're talking about a lot of energy that's needed to reach escape velocity for every pound that you send up there. And I don't think it's... Uh, well, in any case, uh, yeah, I, I, I broadly oppose commercialization of space. Um, unfortunately, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I think is a fantastic presenter, great popularizer of science, clever, funny, witty guy, would be a great person to have lunch with, uh, um, he picked the people for the debate, but he picked them in a way that made it not a debate. He basically picked... Um, all of them were pro-commercialization of space, more or less. Uh, one of them was kind of crazy pro, the rest of them were just pro. It just meant that it wasn't a very interesting discussion because you get a bunch of guys up there who mostly agree with each other. And yeah, they cover some interesting ground. They talk about the development of uh, space startups and, and stuff like that, which is good to know about. It just it wasn't at all what I was expecting uh, at a debate. And so I was kind of disappointed by that. Um, yesterday I meant to go to a, a bad, a bad movie night. We were going to see Spinal Tap, but had a bit of a headache, and that combined with some confusion over who was going to be there, who was hosting. I, I just decided to skip. Um, tonight I, fits permitting, am going to another bad movie, uh, movie night, where we're showing Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, and um, another film called The Room, which I don't know anything about. Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter is known for being amazingly awful. And I actually, I haven't seen it before, uh, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the Room, I don't think it's that one about people who are caught in a whole bunch of, uh, in a whole bunch of separate spaces, uh, shiny walls, they don't know why they're there, and there are death traps all throughout. Or maybe that was The Cube? Yeah, I think that was the cube. Yeah, I don't know anything about the room. Um, but I, 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 bad movies are bad movies, and they're, they're usually fun. Although I probably need to swing by somewhere and make sure I get, um, make sure I pick up some snacks for, uh, for the uh, gathering. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to briefly mention a few, uh, a few movies uh, that, I, I, that I do like, just because I mentioned these really bad movies, which I, I like bad movies. Uh, Birdemic was fantastic. Uh, I love Mystery Science uh, 3000, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, and um, and its modern spin-offs. Uh, and they recently uh, released oh, what, what movie was that? They released oh Super Mario Brothers, which I thought was an amazing camp film. I actually didn't think it was bad. Um, it wasn't good per se, but it's it's campy fun, kind of like Clue. But um, but there are some movies that I really do like that, that I would say are quality cinema. I mean, generally, I like Lars von Trier, usually, although I tend to find him a little bit disturbing. Jan Svankmeyer, similarly. Interesting ideas, often disturbing. Uh, Svankmeyer touches on big social issues, um, and he also does neat stuff with claymation. I like Woody Allen. Uh, Hitchcock and Mel Brooks are, for me, a hit and miss. Um, I didn't like Blazing Saddles, but I like much of of the rest of Mel Brooks's catalog. Um, High Anxiety was another one of his that I didn't like, but um, Young uh, Frankenstein... Uh, I keep wanting to pronounce it Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein uh, was fantastic. Um, Also, uh, like a little bit of anime, Serial Experiments Lane, um, 
And uh, but the, but the good films that I, I like, a lot of them are foreign, um, uh, or at least art house. Uh, there's a film called The Dinner Game, uh, Le Dîner à Décon. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My French pronunciation is also hit or miss, which is a farce. And the premise of the film, oh, I'm going to be very spoily, by the way. Well, moderately spoily. Maybe I won't try and spoil too much. But the premise of, uh, of Les Dîners des Cons is that um, you have a whole bunch of rich uh, French dudes. The film is in French, by the way. So a whole bunch of rich dudes that have a yearly gathering where they try and bring the biggest idiot that they can with them, or at least the, the biggest kook that they can with them. And, and the kook will explain his ideas in front of all of them, the rich guy and all the other kooky guys. And by the end of it, they'll uh, they'll uh, they'll decide who the biggest kook was. It's kind of an interestingly cruel French French humor type of film, which I actually dig that kind of humor. Um, but what makes it a farce is that the dinner doesn't go at all as planned, and you sort of you see one of the rich guys and his kook. Uh, they their lives become entangled in a way that pokes a lot of fun at the rich guy, too, which I also like. Um, it's delicious, snarky humor. Uh, I mean, the, the kook is still a kook uh, all the way through, uh, but the rich guy is kind of a, uh, a schmuck, and uh, and so you, uh, you have two men with different types of faults and a whole bunch of surrounding cast Pokes at, at neat bits of French, uh, or uh, neat pokes at bits of French society, corruption, um, good stuff. It's it's probably my favorite film. Although there are a number of Hitchcock films that I also really like. Uh, maybe maybe Vertigo is my favorite film. I, I have a tough time. I mean, Vertigo has amazing cinematography, uh, neat characters. I, I love Jimmy Stewart um, uh, and. Uh, interesting intricate plot and it also explores human nature and the nature of obsession relationships power in relationships uh, and it's often described as being one of the more autobi uh, autobiographical films that Hitchcock did um, fantastic film um, so there's a, a, a film by Lars von Trier called uh, Director uh, Frida Taylor or uh, the boss of it all, the director of the whole, if you want to be a, a very literal translator, um, which is another farce. I like farces. Um, which is another, it's a scam uh, held by the, by a, and I'm trying to figure out how much to give away, by Somebody who, who effectively runs a company, uh, he, he hires an actor to play his boss um, to make a, an upcoming hard business decision. And the, act, uh, the, the character of, of his boss has never been seen by the employees of the company. So he has to come in, be convincing for them, and navigate this business deal. And things go wrong. They go very wrong. And watching things teetering on the edge of falling apart and people getting stressed out and seeing what people do under stress, that's the, those are the elements of at least uh, many good farces. And this, this film does a great job at that. So, oh, it's, it's uh, Danish. So, I mean, a lot of my favorite films are, are foreign. Not because they're foreign, um, although it does help that... Uh, Art house cinema, or at least what's called art house cinema in the United States, is much more mainstream in Europe. And it's largely there, there was this thing called the Hayes Code that was put together by the, the, there's this organization uh, organization called the Catholic League, uh, used to be known as the Catholic League of Decency, that was aimed that that aims to fight moral degradation in American society, at least as they saw it. And they organized uh, some, um, a set of guidelines for movies that have, uh, and this was like in the 30s up until, it started in the 30s, it was effective up until the mid-70s, um, that established 
norms for how American cinema was supposed to work. And so you, you find, if you're looking at the history of cinema, you have this notion of pre-code and post-code and code eras. Uh, pre-code, uh, we, we were talking about the dawn of, uh, of film, or at least when it was really starting to get big. And radio was slowly being replaced by cinema and eventually television. And the pre-code stuff, people could portray just about anything, um, subject to some decency laws that have later been struck down. Um, once the code started, they, the idea was that good always has to win. So you couldn't ever have a villain win in a movie. You always had to show monsters or bad guys get their comeuppance. Uh, you couldn't show even married couples uh, um, uh, sleeping in the, uh, in the same bed. You couldn't imply that they were sleeping in the same bed. You couldn't imply non-marital sex. You had all these restrictions that were designed to keep America into this Norman Rockwell type existence during, during the code era. And this lasted for a long time and it affected a lot of directors, sometimes for the better because trying to imply things without stating them, it bumped up the use of metaphor in American films. But it also, I think, led to a type of um, moral childishness in American society. Uh, we, the Catholic League was more or less successful in, decide, in making us moral infants. We lost the ability to appreciate nuance in film because you had to have good guys and bad guys. You, bad guy couldn't win. Uh, you couldn't have certain types of conflicts. Uh, and so this lasted for a long time and eventually in the 70s it really began to weaken as uh, because it didn't have the power of law, but it had, uh, Congress was thinking about censoring American films, and instead you had this voluntary um, agreement to, to go by the code instead and have a private regulation. But uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, directors and eventually uh, distributors started to break with this. And by then, um, American attitudes towards this uh, type of intervention had uh, had changed. And so people thought maybe the US government is going to do something about it, but they didn't because there, weren't, there wasn't enough popular support. And so you had the beginning of the postcode era. You had a blossoming of horror movies. You had the introduction, the slow introduction of wall ambiguity into American uh, cultural produce. But it took a long time, and you still have a lot of films that are terrible, uh, like Star Wars, uh, because you had clearly defined good guys and bad guys, uh, little nuance. Um, and the notion that, we, uh, that good and bad are things that we construct and that we struggle over that are usually very complicated, it's slow in arriving to, to American culture and to our cultural produce. Um, we still like to have films that are about the ultimate evil or, or something silly like that, rather than occasionally mentally ill people, but mostly people who are trying to do what's right for themselves and for society who disagree and have natural struggles over that. We'll eventually, hopefully, get, get past a haze, but it's going to take us a while to really forget that era. Um, Anyhow, I think I've gotten off a little bit on a, on a tangent uh, here. Um, I, I like the film Nebraska, which, uh, which is a recent film. Uh, I saw it in the theater. It's about family and uh, dreams and, uh, and finding ways to put aside time for each other, despite how difficult in a family or, or, I mean, it generalizes to friends as well, but how difficult we find each other sometimes. People are difficult. Uh, uh, a, lot of the time we, we ha a lot of the times we have these expectations that families should be harmonious all the time and sterile and uh, people shouldn't disagree. They shouldn't, uh, they, they should always respect each other and all that. And I think that's bollocks, but um, 
but this shows a family that's definitely not that. Uh, it shows a, a kind of quest that on the surface seems ill-advised, foolish, but turns into something kind of beautiful, um, despite all the all the people involved being very complicated, very they, they felt real. They uh, and I guess that's that's something that I, I that I appreciate in the films, not like the reality TV kind of thing, which is all manufactured and pretty disgusting, but just people who aren't uh, who operate well outside the bounds of of being super respectful and and uh, and nice all the time, uh, people who are who know who they are, who are living their life the way that that they want to, and that aren't going to be pushed around by other people's ideas of how people should be, yet people who care about each other. That's, um, to me, what family is, is about. Um, maybe I just come from a difficult family, but and I'm probably a pretty difficult person myself, but that's, it, it's a beautiful film. It, it's an interesting decision to film it in black and white, but I think it, it actually helped with the visuals uh, visuals in the film. I also saw on Netflix uh, uh, two rather good films, one of which is The Bothersome Man, which is about alienation and, uh, and values in society, uh, how people can fit or fail to fit, and at times how alienation can Feel like a self alienation. You have a pretty happy society who a man finds himself injected into uh, through circumstances I'm not going to spoil for you. But he, he finds himself in a society where people seem happy in a sense, but he finds himself really not fitting. And he feels maybe a little bit more human than they do, but not much more human. Uh, he seems ill at ease in his own skin. He certainly seems uncomfortable with uh, with them. And how he reacts to the, uh, to uh, to this existence, um, kind of it, it feels like a philosophical uh, movie. Uh, maybe not one with a solid answer, but with a solid set of questions, and that's really more or less what you want in in good philosophy. A good question is, is worth more than a good answer, although you'd probably like to have both. Um, the other film uh, that, uh, that, I'm, uh, that I saw recently that I liked was called uh, Die Wand, uh, The Wall. Uh, it's a German or German language film, at least. Uh, it might be from somewhere else in the German-speaking parts of Europe. Um, and it's based off of a, uh, off of a rather well-regarded book. Um, and it's, it shows a woman who's going up to visit some friends in a cabin, uh, uh, maybe in Switzerland, uh, in a remote area of Europe. And, uh, and she, she drives up with them. Uh, it's implied that they're going to stay there for a few days and maybe head back. Um, but they head, up, uh, head off to town late at night, and they don't come back. And so she eventually tries to figure out what, what happened, and she finds herself separated from the, uh, from the rest of the world by an invisible wall. And the invisible wall is set most of the way to town, so she walks there. She has a, a lot of wilderness that she can walk in. Uh, she walks there. She finds the wall uh, by bumping into it. And she, she feels it. She doesn't find a way around it. And after a lot of frustration, she heads back to the cabin and starts to build a new life in solitude. Uh, she keeps wandering around. Eventually, she finds some areas where the wall comes very close to some other cabins or some other like remote, uh, remote houses. And she sees people frozen in place. Um, and... Whether they're dead or not, they're certainly separated from her. There's no way of, of getting to them. And months go by where she's farming for herself. She's uh, She has some animal companions. 
and she walks around a lot and thinks a lot. And th this is one, one of the things I like about the film, it's showing her psychological journey being separated from society. It's a beautiful film as she explores a lot of issues about um, whether whether we, we really self-actualize more in society or outside of it. Are we, is our mental existence situated by, um, by the society in which we live and what happens when we're out of it? Do we get clarity? Do we lose clarity? Um, we, we know that, that like prisoners stuck in solitary confinements, they lose a lot of mental uh, health. And, and this is why I, I don't think solitary confinement is a good idea, even in the, uh, even for what might seem like the strongest justifications. But she does have room. She does have animal companions. Uh, she has a lot of time, a lot of space. She's not confined except to the extent that she, I mean, she's caught under, probably under a big bubble or in the middle of a big circle. Uh, but it's it's an interesting exploration of who we are as as a species, as members of a species, and what what it means to be a social animal. So those are um, those are some films that I I think you, you might you might want to see if you have Netflix and you, you have some of them in your catalog. Um, Job-wise, I've been waiting for a certain potential opportunity to open up with a company that I would love to work for. It's a bit of a long shot, um, but uh, I might be getting the nudge that's going to let me start talking to them uh, sometime, maybe starting on Monday or Tuesday. Um, or it might take some time for the nudge to filter to the right people. Maybe it, maybe nothing will come of it. Um, but I'm hopeful. And I've been kind of holding off on looking for other things in the meantime, except maybe part-time stuff or uh, contract stuff. Um, I do... I have a few other opportunities uh, that, that might work out. Uh, there's someone uh, I met in a uh, in t uh, uh, tea lounge um, in uh, uh, up, up in Park Slope, who's a friend of a friend, and uh, he says that they might have some opportunities up there or opening up there uh, soon. He he does startups, and um, I, I guess I am reluctant to work for uh, for startups to a certain degree. Just because things, I haven't had great experiences with startups, uh, and uh, this this last uh, job was no exception. So I'm, uh, I guess I'm more leaning towards bigger companies that have things better worked out, stuff like that. But um, but uh, but on the other hand, uh, for for a short term thing, startup could work fine. And I guess really I, I shouldn't necessarily be writing off all startups. Just should do a lot of research on a startup uh, to before I before I work there. Just because they vary a lot more than uh, than bigger companies. Um, but yeah, there, there's him. There's another person who contacted me out of the blue through I think uh, it's either LinkedIn or uh, or Stack Overflow Careers or Stack Exchange Careers. I, I, I uh, one of those two um, looks kind of promising. They're doing neat things. Uh, both of them look like they would be neat places to work for a while. Um, certainly could provide some revenue, um, which would be nice because living in New York is kind of expensive. Like I'm paying uh, something like 100 uh, or 1150 uh, per month here, which isn't great for savings. Um, but apart from the the long term company that I'm hoping uh, that's a bit of a long shot that I would love to work for, uh, there are a few other places uh, that are doing like uh, scientific instrumentation and sharing and uh, and policy type uh, pol technology and policy type uh, type stuff that uh, I'm going to apply for once 
I can try and line things up so that I wouldn't be giving up on the first company uh, were I to uh, actually get an offer from them because the first company, which is the long shot, it's definitely a high priority for me if, if I can get in. Um, so that's where I am job-wise. Uh, hmm, trying to figure out what, what else to talk about. I, I do a lot of posting on Google Plus and elsewhere, and some of the topics I'd be happy to revisit here. Uh, some of them, then to say, go read what I wrote there. I write a lot, and uh, there, there are always so many things to talk about. Um, Making these videos for the teaching and programming stuff, it is a lot of work, uh, but I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm not quite a, I'm not being as good about uh, spending time on them as often as I probably should be, or at least as I'd like to be. Um, part of this is that my sleep schedule is weird, and I do like to go out uh, at least once once a day. Just it. it it feels like it helps me keep my sanity uh, to just to go outside, go hang out in coffee shops, but that also ends up sucking up a lot of time. And with a weird sleep schedule, that that means that finding time to work on the on the videos is is tough. Plus, it just takes a long time. Uh, I'm not amazing at edi editing videos, so I tend to do uh, things in one cut, kind of like uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, or at least I try to. Rope actually wasn't done in one cut. I think it was done in two or maybe three, but but the point is you spend a long time on on camera and if, if you don't cut then uh, you don't have a lot of you don't have the chance to keep going back to bits that are rough and rework them except outside of the, the main context of I've been talking for half an hour and here comes the five minute bit that I'm not sure I'm getting right uh, it's not quite the same as being able to edit slices in. At some point, I'll, I'll get better at, uh, at editing uh, editing videos, and I probably will be able to manage this uh, this kind of thing. Maybe I'll even get music. Maybe I'll even uh, play music, take out my accordion. But, um, but yeah, it's a lot of work to get this stuff right, and I keep doing take after take. Uh, and I find out that my source materials aren't quite as good as I thought they were, at least for YouTube. They're fine for classes, um, but you work through things differently in a class than you do uh, when you're making a video. And like if you fumble or don't don't spend your time perfectly, you don't really mind because you can be talking with people the whole while uh, if you're there in person with them. Whereas on a YouTube video, you don't really have that kind of conversation. So you're just presenting, and that's, that's rough. Um, but it's rewarding, and I think once I get this right, I'll have something that I hopefully can be proud of, and uh, something that I can point people to, and there's no end to topics that uh, that I can do videos on, or at least there aren't. Well, there's an end, but it's, it's pretty far off there. I, I could spend many years making all the videos that, that I would like to make. Um, otherwise, I'm just enjoying a lot of tea. Uh, have a lot of nice incense. I am eating out a little bit less just to try and save money until I have an income uh, source again, which means less Indian food, which is a bit of a bummer. But oh, well. um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. I, I, I do spend some time gaming uh, most days. Uh, I've gotten back into Kingdom of Flow thing. Uh, and I also recently played through uh, Dishonored, and a little bit further back I played through um, Fallout New Vegas, both both of which I, I like a lot. Oh, my cat is, or at least one of my cats, she's a wonderful, wonderful girl, but she sits my, on my lap in a way that makes my legs fall asleep. So, anyhow, um... I think that's probably all for this week. Um, if you do have comments, uh, particularly if, if there are any topics that uh, that you'd like to ask about when it comes to philosophy, current events, uh, programming, stuff like that, 
can ask them in the comments below and maybe I'll either respond there or I'll, or I'll put in some responses in the next video. Um, so, oh, I had a nice run uh, earlier today. I definitely should be running more often. I weigh more than I would like to. So this is my first run in a while. Uh, problem is it's just, it's been really cold. And today is the first day in a long while when it hasn't been, where, it, or at least the first day in a long while where I've both been in the mood to run and when it hasn't been uh, too cold to comfortably run. Although it, it was pretty close. I, I was pretty chilly out there. But... But, um, well, yeah, it was a good run. Uh, it wasn't very long. Um, hopefully, there'll be some better running uh, weather to come, and I'll be able to lose uh, some more of this weight. I am finally back under 210, um, which I, I actually got up to 215, and I was really disappointed in myself. Um, I'm back a little bit under 210 right now. Or at least I was when I weighed myself. Probably the regular meals and eat that and drinking fluids and using the restroom and stuff, they, they cause that number to fluctuate. But I tend to measure myself in the morning. Um, in the morning when I wake up after using the restroom. That's kind of my baseline. Uh, and I think running hopefully will help. Uh, I've been, I'm always trying to get my diet better. But the problem is I love samosa, which have potatoes in them. And they also have a nice fried surface, so they're not all that good for um, uh, for diet. And there's also uh, um, paneer matni, which is basically paneer in a butter tomato sauce, which is also probably not all that great for uh, uh, for my diet. Um, but I, I I I'm trying to either eat that less often or or to run more or to have uh, healthier other food that I have in my diet. Some combination of that hopefully will let me lose the weight that I want to without making me unhappy because I'm cutting my favorite foods out of, uh, out of my diet. One of the things I kind of expected would be the case when I, uh, when I left work was that would be spending more time each day in museums that tends not to uh, be open during the evenings uh, during the week. But I guess at, at least until recently, I just haven't been leaving the house until something like three or four anyhow, which isn't that long before I would be leaving work uh, during the week. And it's not that great for visiting museums, most of which close sometime around 5.30. Um, and given where I live in New York, it, it often means I'm talking about a 45 minute to an hour trip to get to any of the museums I want to go to anyhow. Um, in New York, you do spend a lot of time on public transit, particularly if you live in Brooklyn and there are places that you like in Manhattan. But even within Brooklyn, um, you kind of learn to tune out that time. You read books, uh, you might take a nap. Um, you might watch a movie on your tablet, something like that. But it still is real time, and it means that if you want to get somewhere, you're, I mean, I, I guess it just means you're going to spend a lot of time in the subway in New York, which is fine. Uh, I mean, I guess rich people might take cabs everywhere and, uh, and have a little bit more time for other stuff, but I'm not that rich. And I think even if I were, I would prefer to spend money on a nicer apartment, uh, better food, uh, donating to worthy causes, supporting artists that I like on um, Patreon or, or elsewhere. Um, I think there's a lot better uses for money. And it also it's just part of the New York experience, I think, to be part of to be part of the society, dealing with the, the issues that most of society deals with, taking the subway. And caring about what the sub uh, about the subway, uh, enjoying the subway, appreciating it. I mean, it's not perfect. Sometimes you have smelly cars, you have crazy people, uh, religious freaks babbling about Jesus, uh, nut jobs who stick pencil pencils in their ears and 
and sit on the floor of the subway uh, and rock back and forth. Uh, idiots dancing and hitting people accidentally. Um, people who just decide to, to sing songs. Sometimes irritating uh, being in the, in the subway or just people who smell bad. Um, or just there's the weird weirdness of being near people who like have nasty deformities, burns, stuff like that. But you cope. And you remember that even if you, uh, with some of those types of people, you're not comfortable with them for various reasons. They're still people. And you don't really want to isolate yourself from, from them. Um, or as the, the father of, of someone I once dated says, uh, it takes all kinds. And it does. It takes all, uh, all kinds to build a, a society. And a lot, of, a lot of the time people, yeah, you, if you're in a big city, you're going to interact with, even a small city, even a workplace, you're going to interact with people who you might not like, but you don't have to be a douche to them. Anyhow, I think those are my thoughts for the week, or at least uh, those are the thoughts that immediately come to mind. Um, I'll, I'll have more on Google Plus and maybe in my blog. Uh, and I'll certainly have more next week. So, uh, that's this video. Ciao!